Hello and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We are blessed that we can be together with you. Amen. And on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we want to greet you and welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Uh, we're continuing on in our study. Mm -hmm. Last week we started, and I, I titled it Mystery Babylon, The Kingdoms of Confusion. So we're looking at Babylon as a starting place of what has become major changes in what Christianity was intended to be. And the reason for doing that is not to sit in judgment of the things that are wrong, but to find the things that are wrong in order that they might be corrected. Because our desire is to be doing what Jesus wants, Amen. hearing from him and doing what, what God the Father wants. All right? Amen. So we're, we're going to pick it back up right there. But before we do, I'm going to ask Brother Mark once again if you'll ask God's blessing upon our time Thank together. Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just ask you to, well, you're already with us, Amen. but Amen. to guide us and to enlighten us to what you want us to know and yes. how to act and spread it to others. And it's all about your love for us and the love that we have for others. Amen. 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 That's Jesus. true. And you know, it says that the goal, Paul wrote and said that the goal of our instruction is love. So ultimately, that's what any of our studies are about, mm -hmm. is getting to that place where we have a greater <clears throat> grasp on God's love for us, that we might share that love all the more. Okay, and walk in that love. Amen. Amen, sister. <laughs> okay. Um, if we're talking about Mystery Babylon, obviously, this is uh, a starting point, of going back two weeks now, I guess was the Tower of Babel. Yes. That, is, that is, and that was the effort of the Babylonian Empire to reach into heaven on its own, own ability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And God put an end to that, put a stop to it. Yes, he did. So we were talking about the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, mm -hmm. that God gave Daniel a revelation and understanding of, which was of this statue this monstrous statue that had a gold head, which was Nebuchadnezzar, the king of it. Right. And then represents four empires. And those four empires were the empire of Babylon to begin with, the Persian Empire, the Greek, the Greek Empire, and finally the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. All right? um, and I, I do want to encourage you, if you've missed any of these, to go back. They're available on the Bible Talk site or in searchingchristianity.com. Um, the important thing now, and what we started looking at last week, was the theology of Babylon. Because what I was saying is, these are four kingdoms, but it's a morphing, okay? Because it's all one statue. It's not like there were four different statues that repre represented four different kingdoms at four different times. It's only one statue, and that's very, very important. So the theology of Babylon, because in Revelations it talks about mystery Babylon, the mystery of Babylon, the mother of the harlots, right? So, I'm saying that the base theology that is so anti-God's <coughs> Word was this. Number one was a salvation by works. The centrality of, a, of the building itself, right? Mm -hmm. The authority of the doorkeepers. I think I said work, uh, workers last week. But that's a little confusing because I'm not talking about the laborers or the builders, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, the, the quote-unquote leadership, right? Right. And once the building is built, the doorkeepers. And the last thing was mis misdirected worship. Okay, so we were talking about the centrality of the building. In other words, the importance of the building in this, in this religious theology. And we talked about, as we were in last week, we were talking about how access to heaven was intended to go through the building. In, in the theology of Babylon, once they reached, they built this tower into heaven. The only way you could get to heaven was through the building, right? Mm -hmm. So the building becomes the center of the religion. Mm -hmm. Its importance is based on the proclamation that it is the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's in, in modern times. It's That's always, right. 
A religious building is always the house of the Lord. Whether it's a, a, a temple to idol, idols, which was common, you can see that, as it goes along in the Persian Empire, particularly in the Grecian Empire, where the Apostle Paul, when he reached Athens, was he says his spirit was provoked by all of the idolatry that he saw around him, all these temples to, to idol, idols, false gods. And then the same thing carried over into the Roman Empire, right? Right. The house of the Lord, the place where God lives. Mm. Well, this is one of the things. If you can't see this, how it's carried into modern Christianity, you haven't ever walked into a building and had somebody say to you, welcome to the house of the Lord. Which, All the time. Which is a grave, grave error. And that's the nicest thing that I can say about it. Okay? Mm. Okay. We talked about the fact God says three times in Scripture, He will not live in a house built by the hands of man, right? You know, just talking about the, a church building being the house of the Lord. I was, I was talking to Alice earlier, many years ago, back in the 70s. Um, Alice and I were over at my aunt's house just for a, a Sunday dinner, I think. Uh, and my, one of my cousins was there. A, a woman who, a young woman at the time, who was like a sister to me, very much like a sister to me. Your cousin. Yeah, my cousin. Mm -hmm. And she was, she had a little boy. His name was Robbie. And Robbie at the time was about five years old. And she was telling us, because we were talking, whenever Alice and I were there, we were talking about Lord. spiritual things, right? So she was telling us how she used to drive Robbie to his daycare or kindergarten or school, whatever it was, every single morning. And every morning they would pass this Catholic church on the way. So one day, Robbie said to his mother, did you know that God drives a Volvo? And she looked at him like, okay, what? <laughs> and he said yes, because every day when they would drive by this church, he saw the same Volvo parked outside. In the front of it. In the front of it. Well, now, you know, if you pass somebody's house every day and they have a car there, you assume that car belongs to them. Well, since this is the quote-unquote house of the Lord, he put, five years old, he put two and two together and figured out that's God's house and that car is always parked on front. That's God's car. God drives a Volvo. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous? Want well, to know something? We have that same childish error in the yes. church today. Yes. How clear can it be in Acts 17, 14, as I said, one of the three places, the God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. This perversion is so evil because it denies the incredible truth that we are the house of the Lord and absolutely creates an atmosphere where a believer acts differently inside that quote-unquote church building than he does outside that building because it becomes that special place. You are the special place. I am the special place. We are the place where God has chosen to dwell. Yes. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Could you tell me where that was again? Thanks. That was Acts 17, 14. No, 17, 24. 24. Thank oh. you. Oh, I looked Thank at you, 14 and didn't look right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Think about the Tower of Babel, by the way. I said the very first thing was the salvation by works. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't have elevators, lifts for my British mm -hmm. friends back then. So if it reached all the way to heaven, you got a long walk climbing and a lot of stairs to climb. It involved work, right? Yes. I'm going to talk about something. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to talk about it. Okay. Uh, probably one of the most well-known, greatest, quote-unquote, house of the Lord that there is, is the Vatican, St. Peter's Cathedral or okay. Basilica in, in, Rome. in Rome, in Vatican City. That was built by the sale of indulgences. Well, it was originally built way back, I, I remember, like in the third, fourth century, around 318 it, started, it was built. But around the early 1500s, it was going to be made into this massive thing that it is today, right? The thing was, you're talking about a massive building project that would involve, wound up involving, in today's terms, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, right? It was originally built by Constantine in the, the first time, but it was the home in the understanding of the Roman church to the vicar of Christ. 
Okay, that's the title of the Pope. Yes. So he is a physical manifestation and representation in their theology of God himself. Mm -hmm. So, and that's his church. So that becomes the house of the Lord in their, in their view, all right? The great rebuilding that took place, that brought it to that place of splendor and grandeur and majesty that it is today, if you judge by outward appearance, the massive expense required led to increasingly perverse financial schemes throughout the empire, but its single most important method came to be the sale of indulgences under Pope Leo X. Now, if you don't know what an indulgence is... Right? That was funding to get this place built. Yes. That was how they funded building St. Peter's Basilica that exists there today. The, the Vatican, no, that whole area, mm -hmm. was built on the sale of indulgences. Okay? This is, that's what led to Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation. The 95 theses that he nailed to the, to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral was about the sale of indulgences. Mm -hmm. Now, these indulgences are, they stem from a theology that involves a place called purgatory. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some of you, may, some of you may be very familiar with this, and some of you may not know what I'm talking about. But purgatory is kind of a temporary hell, yes. where the average Christian has to go to, after he dies, to pay for his sins, to be cleansed for his sins, mm -hmm. Okay. Which is totally anti-scriptural. Well, it is. This is what Martin Luther said, and this is why this is why he nailed those ninety-five theses onto the cathedral door, or proclaiming because he had gotten to the place where the word of God was open to him, and he saw that this was not this is not God's plan. This is not God at all. It is the opposite of God. We talked last week about this theology where God says that salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But because the theology of the Roman Church is that after you die, unless you are special, all right, uh, that you would have to go to this purgatory, mm -hmm. which is separation from God, and it is you're you're experiencing basically the punishments of hell in order for you to be purged and cleansed of the sins you committed. Right. Now, because so the people that they proclaim, this is sainthood in the Roman Church. Who are so special and didn't have that, didn't carry sin beyond their earth on life, that they had like extra credit. And the Catholic Church controls those extra credits. So if you had a loved one who had passed away and now you're being told that he is basically in this, this hell for an indeterminate period of time, it went from basically from praying for the dead, again unscriptural, to paying for the dead. Because you could, you could buy indulgences. And indulgence was like a writ from the, the, from the Vatican that says, okay, you get out of jail early. It's like a get out of jail card. What I, what I remember about it, I, th I thought that the indulgences were uh, like prayers that were already being like, stored up for them. And then you would get so many, then they call them indulgences. Well, you could do other things for indulgences. Okay. okay? I mean, there were other things that a Catholic could do for indulgences. And that, that basically, it's like buying credits yeah. to get your loved one out of purgatory. But the big thing was, and this was a, a, a cardinal named Tetzel, I think. Uh, you know, he came up, uh, the Vatican came up with a scheme, and he put it into place of going around the, the empire, selling these indulgences, mm -hmm. so you could get your loved ones, because this is literally like a hell to them. Right? Yeah, they, it is. You know, they've died, but they're not in heaven. They're not in the presence of God. You know, it says to be absent from the body... You know, Paul says it's to be present with the Lord. Well, not in this theology. To be absent from the body for the regular Christian is to be in this temporary hell. And for nobody knows for how long. But if you donated to the church, they would give you, a basically give you an indulgence, which you could apply to your loved one to get him out of purgatory early. And they were numbered. You would have like a hundred well, indulgences for this and uh, holy cards. You've got so many indulgences. Having the mass said with so many indulgences, that's what I had. But you never knew lighting if candles. It, you never knew if it was enough. Well, you know, you never did. Yeah, you, thousands yeah. of them. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole thing about purgatory, but it, it, it's not a real place. 
purgatory. Well, no, no, let me tell you something. I mean, the idea, we, Jesus hung on a cross and said it is finished. Yes. Okay? There is, it says, if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John, 1 John 1, 7. All right? If we confess our sins, First John says, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's First John, again, in, in the first chapter, of verse 9. Mm -hmm. So you are cleansed. If you are saved, you have been cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to go and have, you know, suffer beyond death in order to be cleansed from that sin. We've, you know, we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But that was connected to the building, because the building was central to the religion. Yes. And by the way, I, I, I really want to make this clear. That is not, and this is what I'm saying, because it has affected all of the church to today, all right? Alice and I spent a lot of time, in, a fair amount of time in Europe, and we've traveled around in Italy. I mean, all these massive, massive, massive cathedrals, and they are indeed massive. And, okay, I'm not, I don't want to get crazy on this, because it's, I could spend all day talking about how horrible I think this <clears> is. <throat> but the, the fact is, people donated to those, or paid for those, worked on those, because they thought they gained God's favor by doing that. I got saved in the mid-70s. A few years later, some of you may remember the Crystal Cathedral. Yes, I do. Okay? The, are you familiar with the Crystal Cathedral out in... Uh, I'm trying, California. I can't remember what part it is. Uh, Garden Grove, California. California. Right? Garden Grove, California. And Robert Schuller came up with this and, and was building this massive very unique at the time, very unique, mm -hmm. and certainly unique outside of the Catholic Church to have this you know, massive building project, the Crystal Cathedral. I will tell you, I, I met many, many people because he had that television show, and on the television show he was raising funds to complete the building of this. Yes. Well, I, I can't, I don't know what was in his heart or mind, honestly, because I didn't spend a lot of time there, but I encountered many, many Christians, mm -hmm. people who call themselves Christians, who thought, indeed, they were buying God's favor by contributing to that building. They thought, because they were putting money into this building, uh, you know, a good way to put it, they thought God owed them something. Now, Alice and I have had the opportunity, you know, in our ministry, to, I have traveled and, and visited with, for whatever reasons God had, megachurches all over the United States of America. Yes. All over the United States. Um... Most people, I find, look at these buildings and they are awed by the magnificence of the building. I am as likely to be repelled by the, by the beauty and magnificence of the building because it has become, like the Tower of Babel, central to the theology. Okay? You have to enter the building to enter the church. Okay? We did, a couple of weeks ago, we did a study on in this series about evangelism, how evangelism works. Well, today, you know, the command of Jesus in Matthew 28 was to go out into all the world and make disciples. Well, we sit back in these magnificent buildings that we spend in oh, like untold, untold millions, if not billions of dollars, yes. and wait for people to come into the building. Mm -hmm. That's That was never the way God intended it to work. When that happens... The building becomes the church. Yes. Go out and do your own little survey. Yes. And ask people, yeah. you know, what church is, and they'll tell you, oh, it's that building down there, it's that building down there. Mm -hmm. How impressed was Jesus Christ with buildings? Not at all. Look at Matthew 24, when he came out of the, out of the temple. And you want to know something? The temple in Jerusalem was impressive. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I mean, this was absolutely impressive. He was unimpressed. He was unimpressed. His, his disciples were impressed. So they were saying, wow, look at this. And he said, you know what? Not one stone will be left on another. He said, that will be torn down in three days. Okay. Because it's not about the building. The Word of God says that Jesus, who said, I will build my church, is building it out of living stones. 
That's us. We are the church. Where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is. And the gathering of believers is church. It is not dependent on the physical location. Please remember that in the early church and early Christianity, they did not have church buildings. They found it completely unnecessary to have church buildings. It says they met, they went from house to house. Because they understood that church is the people, not the building. We don't seem to have much of that today. Lost that. We have lost, lost it. We don't understand that anymore. So that leads to when you believe that that is the way. By the way, who, where's the way? Jesus said, I am the way. All right? Mm -hmm. But when you think you have to go into the building and become you know, a, a member of that congregation inside that building in order to have entrance into heaven, you've been deluded. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not. It says, you know, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. We need to get together in fellowship. But I promise you, the building should never have become that important. Never. Where it, it becomes magnificent. And you need to continually build on it, build on it, and build on it. All right? When you do that, what happens, this is where I said, the next part of the theology that goes in error is the authority of the doorkeepers. If the building is that important, mm -hmm. the people who have access or allow, control access to the building, hmm. right? Yeah. They, they control whether you, your relationship with God by controlling your access to the building. When Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, he once said, and I'm reading from John 10, verses 7 through 9, Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of mm -hmm. the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the only way. That's what he said. Yes. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through me, he said. Right? If, if the Tower of Babel was to be the axis, the way into heaven... Then an elite group would have control of who had access to the building, and therefore ultimately to heaven. Doesn't that make sense? This was the priesthood and the leadership. What happened in the Tower of Babel, where if at the door some guy said, "Oh, you can't go. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to heaven. You you know, can't get where, to heaven. where would you be?" Well, that's that's the whole point, mm -hmm. and it's the same way today. But we we think that we think. That access to God is found inside the building because the building has become central to yes. Christianity. I'm not saying buildings, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a building. I am saying that it is misplaced the emphasis we have put on buildings mm -hmm. and therefore how we revere them, how we spend so much resources. They become idols. They have be, they, you know, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. The buildings have become idols. That's right. All right. Now, the kind, I'm going to talk about the priesthood. The concept of priesthood is in, indeed entirely scriptural, right? Yes, absolutely. In Judaism. Mm -hmm. In Judaism. And that was established by the Lord himself. Now, Jesus on earth gave authority to the apostles. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Okay? He gave them authority to serve the sheep. Yes. Listen to this now. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verses 25-28. The whole concept of ministry and serving in the, in, or leadership in true Christianity is all about serving, always. The ministries that were established by the Lord to function within a church were to encourage and equip, never to control access to the Lord. So what the priest should be doing is grabbing them and pulling them in well, instead it, of trying to keep them out. Well, but it's not even, not they, even don't, yeah. they don't have, the access to the Lord and the fellowship and everything is not in their hands. That's yeah. the whole point. 
I mean, you know, you know, a really, really great example of that was think of this, all right, in, in Mark 10, 13 and 14. Remember, I'm sure you all know this, and it's in, all, I think, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mm -hmm. They were people, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. Yes. But the disciples rebuked them. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Yes. The apostles thought they could control access to Jesus. Yes. It made him indignant. Mm. That's a good point. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you know what it reminds me of? The part in the gospel where there was a, a pool. Where there was a sick man, a storm, yeah. And when the angel Stirred troubled up. the water, that you'd get Somebody the person get to go in and, and they would get healed. Well, this guy was so sick, but so close that he couldn't get in when the water was troubled. Mm -hmm. If there was a person that really loved him, they would take him instead of themselves and put him in the water mm -hmm. because he was in a worse case than they were. Yeah. I, I don't lose sight of the fact, but I'm talking about, it's hard, I mean, listen, Alice and I travel, you go to Af you go to third world countries, you go to Africa, you go to places in Central and South America, you go places like that, and I have, I have preached in church buildings that don't have windows, I mean, they're, I was just looking at a picture, I was just looking at a picture and showing it to Alice, just the other day, I was in Havana yeah. a number of years building, ago, yeah. and the, the building I was in was just a, a rusted tin building, yeah, and oh, what a glorious presence of God there was in that place. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking, I was sharing with a bunch of pastors in there. We have put such a focus on the building, and it is, it is in, indeed idolatry. Absolutely. It is, in, yes. and I think of, I had to think about all of the money that has been spent on these buildings that could have been used, you know what to do? To go out right. and make, make disciples. disciples. Absolutely. Because that is the Great Commission. Absolutely. We have created a situation where, again, we're sitting there, we're building these great big buildings, trying to make them as attractive as possible, hoping that people will come in. All right? And make them as comfortable as possible. Yes. <laughs> well, make them as comfortable because people want comfort. That's exactly. right. We have to get beyond that. We have to come to understand what the true church is. It is not a building, other than a building built with living stones. The church is a gathering of believers. I don't care where you are. And I have shared this all around, all around. Mm -hmm. I said, if you're in a grocery store, if you're, you know, and you meet a couple of other brothers and sisters, and you, 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 you have, you have church. a church, mm -hmm. right? That's right. I, we've had church in some mighty wonderful places. Yes, we have. We need to get back to that place where we start thinking scripturally, yes. that we appraise things scripturally, and we understand that buildings are nice to have, but it doesn't matter if you have it or not. They shouldn't is, become it, idols. Yes. That's what it had, what because you're... Do. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. You want to know something? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Where you are is where he is. Mm -hmm at work, at home, in the grocery store. Come to understand that. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for your presence in our lives, Lord God. And I thank you that you have made the way and that you are the door. In Jesus' name, Father, amen. Until um, next time, God bless you and bye. Far away, stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame but i love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners